Joel Spolsky is the programmer's programmer. He started uh, Fog Creek Software and the Stack Exchange and a whole bunch of other things and was a famous blogger and on and on. And today we're going to sit down and hear what he's working on. Who are you? I'm Joel Spolsky. I'm the co-founder of Vod Creek Software and Stack Exchange. I'm known as a blogger behind Joel on Software, which I started in 2000. Um, founded Fog Creek Software, creators of Fogbugs, which makes uh, programming tools. Kiln is uh, version control. It's a product of Fog Creek. Uh, we recently launched Trello, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more. Uh, and then Stack Exchange is a company I founded three years ago with Jeff Atwood. Um, that's the company that does Stack Overflow, the famous programmer's resource. Uh, about five million U.S. viewers, about twenty million worldwide viewers every month. Yeah, you've been through the whole. Uh change in publishing that I've been. I, I started blogging. That's right, true. That's true. At the same year you did. Yeah, we're the uh, old school bloggers yeah. from the past. What are you seeing happen in that world? Because uh, with Stack Exchange, you have a really interesting viewpoint, I guess, because you're up here at the top of a tower in New York. You get to see everything. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I can look down upon the other, uh, <laughs> the other startup companies. <laughs> So what, what, what's your point of view of the publishing world and what's happening in it right now? I, well, boy, I don't know. That's a big question. Um, I guess uh, when I started blogging, I didn't want to say that I was a blogger, really, because I didn't think I was doing the, I wasn't doing the official blog thing, which was to link to something that somebody else w wrote. At the time, that's what a blogger did, right? You would link to things sort of and say, oh, here's an interesting thing, and then here's my perspective on that. Uh, and uh, and I didn't want to do that because there's enough, I thought that was like sort of too fast. What I, what I did do is I used the tools that were available in those days, which was editthispage.com, the, the tool, the one tool uh, that was available, uh, to publish uh, a series of essays on, on things that I thought I could kind of add more value. Like, let me, let me explain to you in four or five pages how this part of the software development process works or how you should design software or how you should build software companies. Yeah. That, that whole world has changed, too, quite a bit. I mean... Uh, Building software companies. Well, yeah. and software, right? In, yeah. in 2000, there wasn't really cloud computing. There was no Amazon or uh, Rackspace cloud. The, uh, Rackspace right. was building servers for people. Oh, yeah, and the default was to build a desktop app, which you know we, did, we, we had our share, and we were sort of kind of late to the <laughs> web party a little bit. Although Fogbugs was uh, entirely web-based. But the idea then was, like, if you wanted, like, fluent, dynamic user interfaces, they had to be downloadable. Um, that's completely gone and completely mm -hmm. over. And you still, at this point, we're sort of on, on the flip side of that, where you're still hearing people saying, oh, I can't use your software because it's in the cloud. You know, my company will never allow, allow that. And you just have to say, you know, I'm sorry, but you're in such a minority that there's going to be a categories of software you can't use. So that's like literally like saying, we, we refuse to drive cars at this company because... <laughs> like it's like it's like you're giving up on electricity or whatever. You can't you can't do it that way anymore. It's not going to work. <laughs> what's uh, what's the biggest programming challenge right now? Uh, Ooh, what's the biggest programming challenge? I think the biggest programming challenge is that uh, programming is getting harder and harder, and there are more and more different things that you can be using, and some of them will make your life easier. But um, all of them make your life easier only if you understand first the hard way of doing it and then you can take advantage of the new easy way of doing it. So but if you don't understand the hard way, you can't make anything good. So are you saying we should learn C++ first? C, you should learn C, however. I do tell people to learn C first. Uh, but even like more specifically, you know, even though there are these frameworks like jQuery, which will uh, abstract away differences between different web browsers and allow you to build very powerful things, if you were to start with jQuery without having learned JavaScript on which it is built and knowing HTML and knowing how the browsers work, um, you can do some fun stuff, but you can't be a professional programmer. Yeah. You really have to start at, at these lower levels of abstraction. You have to know the HTML and the CSS cold. And then if there's a tool that, like CoffeeScript, for example, which translates into JavaScript, gives you a cleaner version of JavaScript that it translates into JavaScript for you, you can use CoffeeScript, but you can't start there. You have to start at the beginning. And so yeah. I, I think that the learning curve is very, very high. And it's gotten, the technology has started accelerating to the point at which it's not even clear how you would learn this stuff. Like it used to be, at least there was a book you could get, but like our latest product, Trello, is developed on about six technologies, none of whom yet have a book out about them. Uh, what are those technologies? What's the sexy new thing that doesn't uh, have an O'Reilly book yet? Uh, CoffeeScript. Actually, I don't, I, I don't want to guarantee that these don't have a O'Reilly book yet, yeah. but uh, CoffeeScript, uh, MongoDB, yep. Socket.io, 
um, I'm, I'm fr uh, Backbone, forgetting at least two or three others. Um, less CSS, I don't know if we use that, but, but, um, but Stack does, Stack Exchange does. What, one of the things Rocky and I are looking at are small teams that have huge impacts. And, it, mm -hmm. and a lot of that's enabled by all these new things that have come out in the last 10 years. Sure. You know, yeah. the, the ability to publish to millions of people instantly. The ability to use cloud computing yeah. and swipe a credit card and get 100 servers. And get a server. We're 100 servers, there right? Are actually, I, I can think of at least a, like one startup. Before I did the startup that was Fog Creek, I had kind of an idea for a startup and I wasn't super devoted to it. And literally what stopped me is uh, that I couldn't get a, a single server, like a dedicated server. I was like, I'm not paying whatever it was in those days. Like, it would probably be 500 to 1,000 for a dedicated server a month. Um, and you could get co-location, but it was like too hard for me to figure out, so I just got lazy about it. Um, and I wasn't confident enough that the project was worth anything, so I didn't, yeah. And that's Eric Reese's saying, right? Yeah. He said he was- That product, by the way, would have been like Hotmail. Like, it was like email on the web. <laughs> web browser, they would have email. You said you didn't know that it would go somewhere. Right. And his whole thing was he wasted six months programming something, he put up a link and nobody downloaded it. Yeah. He said, said, well, first thing you should do is put up the link to see if anybody's going to download it first, right. you know, before wasting six months of yeah. your life, right? You know, what I always say to people is um, that you want to be your own adversary. So like, let's say you, Robert Scoble, have this idea for something you want to build. Um, then, then what you need to start doing is saying, if my whole goal in life was tearing down Robert Scoble, what would I? What would be the cheapest possible way I could disprove this idea? Like, what's the, what are the what are the top ten reasons why this is not going to work? And of those ten reasons, which of those is easiest to prove yeah. of why it's not going to work? And then you start working on that one thing. So for a lot of startups, that's the thing that won't work. Nobody wants this thing, even if you had a website and and you you, you put it out there, uh, and nobody would click on it or nobody would pay the money. And so that may be an easier thing to disprove. And there are other things that you could disprove, like you, Robert Scoble, are a terrible programmer. You're not going to be able to build this thing. And so you try to prove that by building the code. Well, which of those is an easier, cheaper thing to, to disprove? Like, how can, you, how can you kill your idea fastest? And that's really what it's about, is like killing the bad ideas fast. Wow. Um, so coming back from Eric Ries, back to yeah. small teams, you have 70 people. How, how do you manage your team? I don't know. Yeah, none of them is bigger than eight, and that's a gigantic team that we have of eight people. Uh, and uh, why is that? Why, why, why do small teams uh, work so well? I, I mean, I, and it's not just with code either. The, all the windows in this new World Trade Center were hung by four people. Why? What? Yeah. Really? Every single one of them. For, holy. Thousands of windows were yeah. hung by four people. Yeah, right? and they got really good at it. <laughs> they were just like, bing, 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 I can do 10 a day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what, what's going on? What, I don't know what's going on with the Windows because I would have hired more people. But <laughs> <laughs> but for software development teams and stuff like that, um, there's, there's, there's two fundamental reasons. One, you know, one is something I could just tell you that I know for a fact, and the other is something I've observed over the years. What I know for a fact is that it's all about communications between people. And if you have two people, there's one communication path. If you have three people, there are three communication paths. So you went from one person that needs to talk to one person to three people that need to communicate among one another, which is why the menage a trois situation never really, it's not very stable. Uh, it can't, can't work forever, too many, too many relationships in that bed. And then you get to four people and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, I believe, six paths between four people. Yeah. And it grows like crazy. And once you get to teams of eight people, nine people, they don't even know each other practically. Like there's just way too much coordination communication that needs to happen. It's just not possible for everybody to listen to everybody you're talking about on the order you know, with 10 people of uh, approximately yeah. 50 communications paths. So, not gonna happen. Uh, and, um, and, and the other thing which I can just tell you is that the way we always solve this problem is we, we have sort of a manager of some sort. Uh, you maybe don't call yeah. it manager because you're very touchy-feely, new, new agey. Um, but there's a person that's there to talk to everybody so they don't have to talk to each other. And I've found historically with lots and lots of experience that once that person has five people that they're working with, they have they don't have time for anything else like that occupies a, a, that's a day job is talking to five people wow. um, so that's where that's the right size for a team essentially is it also because um, i i noticed this committee isms at microsoft that even if the team was manageable in size you know for instance you have if, to check in with everybody so well, they don't it, get angry people's about tastes something. are different and if if yeah. you have everybody being a committee you start uh reducing the, the quality of the experience. For instance, right. if, if we went to, are going to go to Well, you to polish lunch. it, you polish it. Like it starts to get like, so it can't offend anybody. 
It takes yeah. everybody's accounts into consideration. There's somebody at the desk from the Turkish Windows team who can remind you that in Turkish, there are two styles of the I uppercase letter, one with a dot, one without a dot. And, and, and they will bring that up at every meeting and nothing will ever go wrong in Turkish Windows having to do with the I with the dot and the I without the dot. Because um, that person will continuously remind you of that. Uh, but you're never going to invent anything when you're sitting around worrying about dots in, in just the Turkish version. Yeah, it's a big market, Turkey. <laughs> Absolutely, can't be, can't be forgotten. <laughs> but it also it also leads to experiences that are bland, right? Yeah. I sat on the floor when Robert Fripp recorded the four uh, sounds in Vista, uh -huh. and he recorded for I don't know 18 hours. He was he and it was amazing to sit there and just listen to him because he's a master guitarist. Yeah. And they recorded, I don't know, oh, thousands like of songs. Oh, those little sounds. Windows yeah, Windows. when you start up the computer, it yeah. plays four sounds. And of course, um, uh, you know, I have a CD of the final 20 so sounds, which aren't the really interesting ones. You know, in studio, he was playing really cool stuff, right? Because yeah. he would goof off and he'd start playing a riff or something. Right. And it was fun to, none fun that, to none watch, right? None of that survived. And then yeah, the like final this is 20. Be to somebody in cashmere. <laughs> yeah, that's a place I think. Well, and, uh, exactly, and that's where it's going, right? The yeah. final twenty, they picked the worst one. It, it, you know, they picked the blandest one because that was the trademarkable one. It, in other words, they went through teams of lawyers and teams of executives, right? And all, and, and all they could do is just remove things that stuck up. Yeah. So, so, is that something you worry about? I mean, I, you know, uh, to make sure that you have no, because I got small teams. <laughs> But even with a small team, you have yeah. to have somebody who makes a decision, right? I'm, I'm, yeah, I am more worried about the other direction, which is that at some point you start learning from experience and you start getting um, this kind of uh, what I call arterial sclerosis, which is like as you get older, you start to say, oh, don't do that because eight years ago I did that or so-and-so did that and bad things happened, yeah. whatever, whatever that was. And uh, sometimes that helps to know like all the bad things that can happen. Um, sometimes it kind of hurts. Like we know now with Fogbugs, this product's been out there for 10 years. It has um, you know, tens of thousands of people using it all the time. And they really depend on it to continue to work in a certain way. And we can't just say, hey, it's, let's make the user interface upside down. Um, we just can't. And maybe upside down will be awesome for Fogbugs, but our customers will lynch us and we'll lose a lot of money. So we have to do things like in this case, Trello, which is almost like the opposite of Fogbugs in every possible way. It's like, you gotta reinvent this, make a new product and just do it differently altogether. Yeah. You can't just change that thing out there. I mean, I don't know how much, there was a lot of blowback from the office toolbar things. They rearranged yeah. all the toolbars and the menus. And at that point, people did not need a new version of Office. Everybody that I knew would have been perfectly happy with when, when Office 95, Word 95, Excel 95, fine. Those were awesome versions. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe add a couple more features, but like yeah. nobody, nobody needs anything that they've done in the last 15 years. So the changes that they're making are, can only be negative. Right, like all, all you can do is ruin their experience that they were already having, which is a perfectly fine experience. Yeah. Trello. Yeah. Uh, Since this, you mentioned it. This is Trello. This is a new product that just came out of Fog Week. And what is it? Okay. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> What's uh, going on here? <laughs> so the basic idea with Trello is it's a list of lists. So uh, this is called a board, and you can make as many boards as you want. First right? of all, th what is this for? Is this for keeping ta track of tasks, or wh wh um, what is it for? Yeah, it's for, it's for teams keeping track of what everybody's working on, usually. But you can use it for any kind of list of lists. Like, um, m mostly, if you have a group of people, this is the, the, the Trello team themselves keeping track of what the Trello team is working on. Uh, this is an example board that I made for, for a uh, tech news uh, website. Um, this is an example board that I made for a group of people that are just basically flipping houses. And so they've got projects that they want to do on the house that they're flipping, and they've just divided them into construction, landscaping, stuff for the open house. Um, and, you can as and this is a small team. You can assign people to things by dragging them on there. You can, if something comes up in the wrong place, you can move it. You can decide that this is really... Uh, and this is all collaborative. If I was in California on this page, or on this Trello, yep. I would have seen that card move. Yeah, so here, I'll, let me just bring up another window. Here's uh, Firefox, and this is uh, Chrome here. And so if I make a change here, actually, let's do it the other way so you can actually see it. <laughs> if I make a change here, uh, that instantly shows up on all other web browsers everywhere else in the world. Um, so you can kind of coordinate with people that way. And uh, the idea is you could be having a phone call or be in a room sitting around computers. Just going over this stuff, saying, all right, what's everybody working on? What do we think about this? Is this higher priority? All right, let's move it up to top priority there. And uh, um, who wants to work on this one? Oh, Michael's going to work on that. All right, I'm putting your name on that. And this is now approved, so I'll put it over there. And 
put it right there in priority and attach a file to it by clicking on it, going in the back and hitting upload and finding a, uh, there's a good file as a PDF, worthless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, attach, attach files to that, attach images to that. It can have a little conversation back here saying, hey, Michael, I'm showing Scoble Trello. Trello, that's not a real comment. But uh, basically, uh, uh, as these comments happen on the back of cards, there is, um, let's go to the big one over here. There's an activity feed uh, down here on the bottom right. And uh, people get notifications so they can see all the stuff that re regarding them that's happened anywhere in Trello. So um, we're having conversations about the cards. We're moving them around. We're using this to communicate. And we're keeping everything about that project or that article or that little piece of work on the back of the card so it's all there as it, as it moves through the stages. And usually you have multiple stages here going across from left to right. So um, you know, this is a, a technology website. So you've got story ideas, approved stories, things yep. that are getting written right now, stuff that needs to be copy edited, stuff that's ready to publish. And then if you decide to spike something because it's not worth going out right now, you can make a new column for that. You can add lists whenever you want. Waiting for Godot, I don't know what that means. And, uh, and throw things in there. You can rearrange lists freely. Everything is sort of very, very flexible and very and it's all a web page. Uh, it's all in the web browser. Yeah. So. And can I have public uh, Trellos and private ones? Uh huh. And yeah, there's sort of different levels. You can have public, private, organization, um, kind of everything you would expect. You can make a Trello. This this is the Trello Trello. So this is what the Trello team themselves are working on, and they've made it world readable. So notice that I can't uh, move things here myself uh, because I don't have write permission on this board, which is interesting because I'm the CEO. Okay, and <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's a coup for me <laughs> to remove you from CEO role. Uh, but this is how, how we're going to know we're getting fired if we can't get into our own. Uh, I, I can go in and vote. <laughs> <laughs> Very suspicious. I can go in. And, I can see anything. I can go in and vote, and I can add comments because that's the way they configured this board as a, yeah. as a public member of this board. And then uh, on, on the private boards, you can uh, invite people just by uh, um, typing their name in. Uh, I could put in your email address and it would, uh, um, hold on, it's looking for other people named Robert on Trello right now. Yep. Um, I could invite you to this board and then you could participate or kick you off and then you don't participate. All the little icons in the top right hand corner are members of the board. These are people that are that are current active members of the board and I can um, take take their pictures and drag them onto cards. This is where I was going though with the small, small teams, big yep. impact thing. Um, this lets a small team really get yeah. a lot more done, right? Because they have it all there and it's very collaborative and it's very clean and it, I can see what I'm supposed to be working on. Right, and you can see what other people are supposed to be working on. You don't, you don't have to ask everybody what it, you know, who's working on that particular thing. You can just look up there and see who it is. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, one, one style of, of way that people work with this, I mean, obviously it can be used by individuals. There's all kinds of ways of working with it. But one way of working with it that I found effective is you have a team of people Again, you know, anywhere from two. We have um, our, our graphic design department. Two people. They have a board where they keep track of all the graphic design requests that are coming from anywhere in the company. Yep. And you can go in there anytime and see what they're working on next and what their highest priorities are and when your thing is going to get done. And you can comment on it. and You can see mockups. Can for different lists in here? Can you have different groups of people and different per permissions? For instance, in the graphic design one, I would want the whole company to be able to put. Put new uh, ideas, new in. ideas, yeah. or new suggest new uh, things that they need. We don't, we team. don't quite have that yet. Now, okay. but the basic idea is we started with something reasonably simple that's still very useful, uh, and that's what we just sort of launched two weeks ago. Uh, and now we're building an API, and what we're hoping is that developers will build cool plugins that do stuff like what you just described, like permissions, workflow, um, you know, a way for people to anonymously submit new things to boards, or change the background color, or play Angry Birds on a card, or whatever. <laughs> All of the strange things that programmers do. Yeah. Tell me about, uh, just for the last couple of minutes, tell me a little bit about the culture of your company, because it's very different than most companies. Uh, each programmer yeah. has their own office. And um, yeah, well, certainly, uh, at least at Fog Creek, they're, they're a little bit different. Fog Creek and Stack Exchange are slightly different companies. Stack Exchange has a lot of programmers working remotely from home. They're all over the world. Um, the culture is chat rooms and Skype, actually. Uh, although there is an, a, a Stack Exchange office in New York, and it's got some programmers uh, in it, um, but uh, if, you know, Fog Creek, the, the, the culture, the design was really about like making the ideal place for a programmer to be productive, for a software developer to want to work, want to work at, kind of, and that's how 
we were so successful in recruiting the awesome people that can build stuff like this, um, you know, quickly and make it awesome like this. Um, and so, uh, among other things, uh, we believe that a developer should be in a private office with a door that closes. Um, and um, actually, we found that that improves communication. Uh, everybody has uh, these, these automated desks, which can kind of you push a button and they move up and down. Yeah. Where's my up button? Um, so they can uh, adjust the height. They all have lots and lots of monitors, uh, pretty much as many as they want. This is this this configuration is actually the most popular, um, just because any more than this and you're turning your head too much. It's a 30 and a, I guess that's a 24 or something, or is that a? I mean, the main thing is like uh, I, I'm happy to buy people as many monitors as they want, but at some point they're turning their head more than they care to. So. Um, this seems to be the sweet spot. Uh, and uh, you know, the comfortable chairs, and we serve lunch here, and just really good working conditions. And, um, and, and you know, all about that, and that makes it easy, easy for us to recruit great people. Um, but it also helps people get work done, because programmers need to be able to sit in quiet conditions, really concentrate on what they're doing. And once they're in flow, they need to be able to sh shut the door and not get interrupted while, yeah. they, while they get really productive. Talk, talk to me about flow, what do you mean by that? Flow meaning, um, uh, a programmer will get into the state, um, actually pretty much anybody doing creative work, where they're really deeply concentrating on that and everything else just kind of falls away, they forget about their life, they don't know what time it is anymore, they're just like deeply enmeshed in coding. And then uh, they're in the zone, exactly, and they'll wake up like two hours later and look up and they'll be like, whoa, and they just wrote like 90% of the code they're going to write that week uh, during those two hours. And it's very, very hard for people to get into the zone, and it's hard for them to force themselves to get into the zone. Most of the time they're sitting there going, uh, Hacker News, Reddit, Hacker News, Dig, whatever it is. And then, and then suddenly they get in the zone for some reason, I don't know why. And uh, the most important thing is once they're in that zone, like not to knock them out of it. So we don't know how to get them back in, but we do certainly know how to get them out of it. And if it's a salesperson, the phone rings and a salesperson says something, or a programmer over there starts to have a really interesting conversation about code, and you're like, hey, I want to participate in that conversation, that'll get them out of the zone, and it may be days before they get back into it. So the, the, the formula for productivity, I believe, is the private offices. Um, people think, um, it, it, I mean, Robert, we walked around earlier, the hallways of Fog Creek here. Um, people think that it feels like atomizing or private or quiet, but this is probably the most social office you'll see. Yeah, there's lots of social York. activity here, right? All Which, the time, and the reason is that, yeah. first of all, like uh, right behind us, there's a lunchroom over there, so you can actually see people um, hanging out and having conversations, and you know they're not in the zone, so that's where you have conversations. And if you want to talk to a programmer, you go knock on the door and go in their office and have a conversation. If you go look at, uh, I won't name names, but any number of other companies in New York or in Silicon Valley where it's just a big old room with a bunch of desks, and they would probably tell you, oh, it's awesome, open communication, open flow, everybody overhears everything, it's terrific, I love that about my company. But those places are either library quiet or nobody is getting work done. And library quiet is like they're afraid to have a conversation because they don't want to distract all the programmers. They're like, they're like, they're like chatting on IRC, even though they're all in a room together. It's just creepy, you can't even have a conversation without like the whole company stopping and turning and looking and saying, hmm, hmm. people heads pop up over the cubicles. Or, uh, or it's just like noisy and everybody's like yakka, 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 nobody's actually getting work done. And you or they, uh, the programmers have headphones on. Oh yeah, on. they get the headphones on. That's <laughs> actually, there was actually a study that showed that, 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 that um, listening to music um, prevents you from uh, having deep thoughts. You can have shallow thoughts, just not deep thoughts, <laughs> uh, while you're listening to music. Like, like it's just enough, like with the coding and the music and stuff like that, to have, just have trouble um, actually noticing certain things. So um, the experiment in this study uh, that was done, and unfortunately, it's reported in the book People Wear, but it wasn't yeah. published as a study. And uh, I love to see somebody try to reproduce this. But they gave somebody a multiple choice. They gave students a multiple choice t test, and uh, the there was a pattern to the answers. I think it was like A B C D A B C D A B C D A B C D A B C D all the way through, and it went on for pages and pages and pages. It's a very easy multiple choice test, and they gave two groups of people um, the same test, and one of them was listening to music with headphones. You know, and they tried different classical and rock and whatever. And the other was just in a quiet room. And the, uh, the people in the quiet room, everybody got the right answer. But the people in the quiet room noticed the pattern, A, B, C, D. And at some point, they're like, this is all A, B, C, D. I'm just going to just hit A, B, C, D. And they finished early, essentially. Or they noticed the pattern and reported it. Uh, the people with the headphones just never noticed. They just went on taking the test happily, getting, you know, two plus two, four, whoopsie. You know, <laughs> they were easy things. So they just kind of, Kind of blast it on. So the the theory here is that like actually being able to like drown out other noises 
is also drowning out that noise in your head that says, wait a minute, why am I cutting and pasting code? I should be writing a subroutine for this, or there's a better way to do this, or I got a cleverer thing, way of doing, way, way of doing that here. Interesting. So um, this is what makes you interesting. Yeah, because I make up shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then I build offices for the programmers. <laughs> so I stand behind the things that I make up. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, making it up for me. <laughs> You're welcome. <Exactly. laughs> I appreciate yeah, it. Very thanks much. for coming. By. Where do I, uh, again, where do I find you on the web? Or uh, find um, yeah. Well, where is the stuff? Start with Trello.com. That's a, that's for this app. T R E L L O dot com. Uh, I'm uh, at Spolsky on Twitter. JoelOnSoftware.com is my blog. Uh, what else do I have on the internet? Google Plus number one seven six eight five zero three two two nine seven. I don't know. Did you actually memorize that shit? <laughs> no, no, <I> don't know. <laughs>